to do. Before we get started, what I'd like to do is share some past news with you. We are truly a global organisation, so I'm Scottish, speaking to you from the UK, and Ira, I believe, is from the US. So it's lovely to have an international audience, I think. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And there's a few items I'd like to bring to your attention. We have some SQL Saturday events in the United States. So we have Washington and we have Nashville on the 18th of January. I believe Washington's just been uh, done and dusted. On February the 8th, we have Cleveland, which is, I think, in Ohio. Who says British people don't know American states? <laughs> and here we have in, in Tampa as well. Now, we have some up upcoming international events as well. So we have Slovenia, which is taking place this weekend. That will be wonderful. Slovenia is a wonderful part of the world. And then in January the 25th, which is Rabbi Burns Day, it's Albuquerque. And then on March the 1st, we have Budapest, which is in Romania. So it's wonderful to see all these equal Saturdays all over the place. So something to mention, um, we've got, obviously we have uh, about 23 virtual chapters now. We've had some new additions coming online as well. So we have a database fundamentals webinar on the 7th of January and it's on at 7 o'clock GMT. And that is database DBA 911, database corruption by David Maxwell. If you are interested in getting a fix of more of our webinars, I'd like to point out the past virtual chapter website for business intelligence and it's actually got a presentation archive which I've put here for you. So here's a list of our past virtual chapters. So, pass, pass analytics. So, here. Oh, this is Aaron Whiteside. Can you hear me? Hello? Hi, sorry. There we go. And uh, just a quick phone check. And I want to be sure it's not on the end. Uh, your voice is breaking up a little bit. Just want to make sure that you guys can all hear me. I see from the chat log that you can. So uh, I will continue. And uh, hello, everyone. I seem to be able to do an uh, international presentation. Uh, I'm Michael Whiteside, uh, independent consultant to solve any actual business intelligence. Today, we're going to take a 45 minutes uh, and go through a relatively informal session. I'd like to talk about uh, what I've learned over the last year, particularly in the, in the situation of MDS as it was to MDM. I've worked in the area of data quality and MDM for, for uh, many years, uh, but I spent a good part of this year and a half actually working on implementing MDS. And I, I'd like to, to put to what you need to context from planning and uh, kind of a methodology perspective. We'll also take a look at uh, the function and capabilities as we're going to watch our presentation. So here we go. So today's implementation. Is most part really got all of the same issues. 
uh, enable or constrict, depending on your point of view, as an MDI by some of the excellent capabilities and also by some restrictions. So to say that, uh, as I've indicated here, it's a very operation requiring all the capabilities. I think what we want to be able to do is turn that into something that's uh, a lot more easier to do. Uh, uh, hopefully realizing that beyond the agenda day, this is probably the kind of bicycle or motorcycle I'd want to ride. Gone as opposed to the uh, astro bike with somebody in front of it. And I said that uh, I'm trying to get across here. The message is that we really need to be able to use the capabilities of MDS. Surround that with a to using all techniques that are currently known and standard, and try to get into a very business in it, and I would have iterative approach. As we look at it, basic technical level for a second, and I said we're going to focus a little bit of requirement and uh, some of the challenges and issues that you may face. Methods, MDM is still uh, predominantly so MDS, I'm sorry, based on the MDS, as well as it relates to MDS, is right here. I have a call, and I'll go through that in a little while. I'll go server and use some detail on TV Server Central. Use some detail on uh, the processes we're going to see. And as we go through the presentation today, uh, please uh, ping Jen with any questions or let me know. I, I'd like to be address them as we go along. Uh, that's no problem at all. Referring back to the diagram, the source data obviously is going to be the key issue and even more so in MDM. So we're going to take our source, we're going to load it to a predefined staging area. This becomes important that you understand there are sort of predefined staging tables and requirements we're going to have to meet for MDS. And uh, well, obviously on the right hand side then we're going to be able to uh, instantiate and create our model. Uh, Again, I'd add that as you go through this, and I, I want to kind of struggle to put this in the context of kind of our standard types of BI and ETL and integration application projects. Even though MDM in essence serves many applications in the end, getting it built is still a singular operation. So I've broken uh, our point rule number one is to present a long detailed list And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of walk through this, list, even though it's ugly. Uh, you can see the plan for it. I'm going to take a second and kind of walk through them more interesting to a little bit. But it kind of starts with the idea that first, there's a linear set of things to do. So, you know, this is definitely kind of an MDS one of you. I think that. If we were to consider the, I'm sorry, if we were to consider the steps needed for yes, they're the middle step there. Start with things like chaining entities and working our way through uh, business goals. I think these top few get lost. These top business requirements in some type of worksheets for our metric dimensions and these conceptual. Attributes. Then you're going to go through this process in the in the cycle, we like it or not, having to derive patterns, uh, work to load into pre-aging, moving into MS, loading into MDS model of health, subscription these groups, implementing these rules, and implementing some faces on their side subscription rules for people to be able to see. So my point is. First time you you really need to be the kind of in context and in some degree have 
the end in mind in terms of what you want to create. And then that, that can be difficult in MDS because while you think you may know, gee, I want a reference table for geography, I want to be able to code these, or I want to be able to fit salesmen in a particular organization. There are complexities and they change the way you do that. So talk about the physical, conceptual, and the physical. Part of the challenge here is Portable MDM, and you're going to find out MDS that for the most part is much like traditional application. And if you want to uh, take a look at the Tyler Adams book MDS XPs and bought a few key steps on the model. This is taken from uh, Tyler Adams Master Services. I certainly wasn't sure we we'll give credit for what he's done, but I think there's a nugget there in there uh, that critical. And that is the uh, section that pulled out here. And again, we're we're breaking some rules here. It's somewhat tight, but I, I, I've seen the biggest challenge that in the MDS projects that work the year of this year have been in the product identifier established what was really to be required, talking about the soft views in terms of modeling environments and of Kind of a pell mell race trying to throw MDS and pocket entities, which is, as I've said before, pretty easy to be selling. They sell it really only encompasses about 10% of what you're going to need to do. So if we take a look here at these steps, I really think they're critical here. Again, my presentation, but the idea is that you really have to take time to define high level business strategies and see stuff. You have to understand in some of the things I've worked, one of them was a provider model within a health organization's applicant, being able to understand where we would go, have the business process lined up. Uh, experience my first time at the beginning of this year, those were not done. So without getting some idea on of what you're looking for, you find that you're quickly throwing tables, but since all you're doing is using it and create a table. Uh, and unfortunately that is a really that's a very expensive tool, not in terms of price, but in terms of an effort to be accomplished that. You really want to get the value out of it, make sure you understand uh, each of these items. And when I do my presentation and any board I'm going to show for a little while, anything you guys send me an email, my email up the screen, I'll get that to you. But that, secondly, for each master entity, find the entities that need to be resolved arithmetically. What that means is, and it is key points, MDM and MDS model is not just a, a relational model. The key thing that is or record linkage slots. Really want to get an understanding of what these candidates are and be able to get them. You know, again, looking at, at in the standard kind of model implementation where we know there are multiple sources that have multiple issues in terms of names and addresses. And that it requires putting some thought and strategy for defining Tyler refers to it as algorithmically I would refer to it as that you have to understand and document it in spreadsheet and do some thought to in model. Where am I going to relationship that's many to many? And what are the candidates and how am I going to go about understanding how to how to accomplish it? It deserves a separate session to talk about how to use fuzzy matching within fuzzy matching capabilities or other capabilities that are out there. Uh, albeit working the logic
not going to say iterative and walk your way through this and you want to get stuff and take over and go back. In the beginning, it's complex set up some of those things to work out. So for each of the entities, then define attributes. Uh, we define what we need to be. And again, it seems like a drop list, but it's critical here. We want to add the identity attributes that we define. We basically, we'll be taking an MDN to our schema. And I've used a methodology over the years called metric decomposition, which is this methodology very similar to what Kimball has in uh, requiring stock in the business needs. A lot of what we've done here predates a little bit. But the idea is capture before the business requirements and break them down into metrics and specifically dimensions and hierarchies. So we have a pretty understanding what we're trying to meet and talk about business before we jump to the actual creation. Model the relationships. Uh, and I have articles on you can accomplish that. So that as a part of our requirements, we cannot create the model without having first on the profile. I have articles available on how to do that without purchasing a product. Uh, obviously, I know more than even provide other components. The key here is that uh, you accomplish the data profile. And uh, with a few more slides, and then we're going to get into look at some worksheets, take a look at some of these requirements, uh, and also some activities in Secondly, and again, while we're in this model and requirement case, that model of our system, and again, we're relying on business expertise, technical expertise, data profile things that we've got to have that you need to understand what are the issues I have to do. As I note in mind, MS, while it has many capabilities and even some capabilities to capture that may the fields, regular questions, you can transform data inside the ES. It is not to go on there. Uh, the Microsoft and all using SSI or data cloud services. Uh, in either case, or writing your own PC call, you're going to have to work off that ETS rule beforehand. And another thing we'll talk about is a little bit of the limit concept that as you bring it in, that you up into the model, you're able to track back where it came from. Of course, model land in the state area, those still have to be modeled. Again, it's it again going on is oh my god, to do all the things that we know we have to do. I guess it's in my mantra would be yes you uh, you have to have understanding, firm believer in iterative and agile, follower of this is model, uh, it's scoping ever. The first two you have to GT, but I'll actually uh, send you copies of this. And as you build a dimensional model in the BI world, you build something called a business matrix. Uh, this is a little bit lower than that, but what I'd like to do is, if you can put together a worksheet, given that you've gone through the backup a little bit, then you've gone through steps and understand your steps, which is why I've been in detail in the beginning, then I think that you, in my opinion, approach the completion and the completion of the project from a matrix and dimensional perspective. And I apologize, I am in Chicago and there are major sirens going off. So that's uh, he said he's in our model. Particularly, have modeled the staging names, which is a direct result of creating entities within MDS. And we've created a series 
the column. And those columns actually represent, even though I can't read them, steps that are required. Attribute as go along, and uh, and the anti is an attribute that may form our complete and moves in MDS. Uh, then that you're going to have trouble finding MDS skills probably folks learning along the way that really need to have a number to a few things miss some items. So here what we've got across the top is those steps. Creation of initial entity, creation of views, creation of something like domain based views, creation of the business. Again, so you're able to kind of see and walk through this process and say, oh okay, here's where I'm at. Because in the end it's, it's very much like a fact. This actually looks a little bit like a Kanban board. And on the left, I've got my attitudes. Those are my parts. And on the right, I've got my task to get to the actual creation of my product or my model. And I'm going to have to either eat them all or logistically know they don't Going under your team, it just has to understand how to load and implement an MDS model. People own an uh, article on loading MDS, specifically creation of the model, and it's linked to Nicholas Barclay's article from years ago, also uh, finds the creation of the geography model. I, again, highly recommend all of these. And then, last, certainly, I would recommend using uh, Microsoft's data service. Second edition uh, by Tyler Graham is an excellent book, very worthy. And while I would definitely say it's an excellent book, it will not be only use. Let me tell you, for sure, there's any issues. There. So that's the plan. Uh, we're going to take a look now at walking through and looking at the worksheet and just taking a walk through MDS. My objective is not at all to be able to teach you specifically how to do everything in MDS. The title of Gorilla MDS is really trying to imply it. You truly understand what your objective is and what your tactics are, tasks are, uh, then you'll be able to put this more holistically and understanding between your team what you need to get. So, uh, but to doubt a little bit, uh, the first thing that I'd like to look at is, uh, is uh, a set of worksheets. And uh, so here we've got, and this is pretty much a, a live project so that I can provide anybody who's, uh, who's interested. But uh, what we've got is a little data profiling worksheet. And those of that might have seen some of my earlier presentations know I, I spend quite a bit of time talking about data profiling. But if you consider where you begin, you want to know ridiculous about that analogies up the laws do here. And understanding this is some of our uh, staging tables and source tables. And we've got some things on very high level. Uh, what are in each columns? What are the minimum domains in the column? You know, what are the maximum domains in a column? What else is going on in terms of that column? The, book, the null count. And again, give the textual idea. And I cover the other machine. Frequency or domain in L so that as you look into the you are able to understand for a particular column analysis would mean your process, and, and I've got references on Super Central on how to do that. The domain analysis would be another spreadsheet here that says, hey, I've got zip code uh, as one of the attributes in my postal code entity, and uh, gee, I've got four, four characters zip codes or three characters zip codes. So the whole idea is that very early on in the beginning, frankly, before you've even gotten the business pretty much nailed, you truly don't understand what you're facing in terms of friends and 
dedicated organization because that is going to be their main challenge. Is, is if you start trying to load, you really be to the point to resolve the issue. You won't be able to load and resolve them. Uh, as I know, once you're implementing your MDS model because using your GUI, and, and we talked a little bit later on about using stored procedures, but assuming you're going to have a, a staff of this analyst and analyst trying to use the MDS GUI, one of the things that is where you did it up and now you found anomalies and you have changing things. This is Free to ask any time. Uh, so let's start with um, opening up yes. And one sec here. Okay. So again, keeping this at the higher project level and there's MDF running here and it's taking this. Here's our MDS3 page. I'm trying to check myself and they do explain to install it and, and all other configuration issues. Let's look at one with it. MDS GUI is relatively straightforward, uh, at least in terms of the, uh, the initial exploration. It will get a lot more complex when we start talking about, about this. Let's take a model. model of like, we'll look at customer scene model. Okay? If we look at we've got an order function that you're going to use a lot. That is the primary interface from the web based Administration, integration management, version management, user groups and permits. System administration is where you're going to spend most of your time. It's where you as a developer or a data analyst is going to be created and an attribute and the relationship that you need. And that's design the model. If you explore is where you're going to spend your time during data, looking at data, understanding things, uh, and with those entities and attributes. Integration management, where you're going to be able to cause tables that have been created and put it into your or look at each of these in the set. And it's also you're going to be able to create subscription views so external applications will be able to get the value of the master data locations or teaching applications. Version management is important. Yes, you have the ability to create versions of different business rules, different hierarchy systems, versions on them, promote them at a given time, very critical. And lastly, you groups of permissions where I'm going to maintain security uh, group and in new level, they're pretty standard and straightforward stuff. So let's start with Explore. Lord, 
Uh, and looking at this case, it isn't completely intuitive. So let's just take a second here. As you look at the floor, across the top, you can pick the entities you want to look at. You can pick the air keys you want to look at, portions, which the term degree is indicated, and then, of course, itself, which is three times up. You can see that we're looking at entity, and, and let's There's the concept here, and uh, and again, I'm trying to not get too deep into the design. But one of the key concepts in MDS, and you'll run into this in modeling, is that everything is stored pretty much uh, in, in the entire S modeling structure is kind of based. Uh, and it consists of their customer name and address. Along the way, you're going to see some notations uh, like here. For instance, at since US and United States, that's an indication that it's a domain-based address. It's understandable. But in that, you need to put it as my cover information is one thing uh, where I have some unique values based on and that customer code, like say the code, like country or uh, salutation here, or we'll take it a few others. Strict uh, art based, which means that they're references, they're lookups, if these that only have information occurring specific to that entity, and everything else is linked to domain based attributes. That is key. As the yes, interface, and I kind of started with the interface here because for folks that want to be able to create models and then have users name their entity, this is the stock GUI to do. Here, in essence, if you to come in and customer see we've got a little navigation number over on the right. Freeform because city is populated postal code. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then the yes, we can implement something called the business rule, which is going to mean if we type in a postal code here, it'll automatically figure out what's the uh, state and the province. Given that, once you've made your changes, you can get it OK. See here, we now have by store. Apologize because it has to do with MDS, and that's probably going through this a little too fast. But I'd like to have you understand what some of your uh, kind of key issues are, at least in terms of education. And one of them is here. Okay, so we've been, gone in, we, everybody kind of sees boxes over here, they make the update. What they don't realize is then when you enter your rule, they get applied on quickly. You have to come here and apply. So you have to hit the Applies Rule button, which will then validate if you notice our bicycle demo change from a question mark to a check mark, which means it has been validated. It's important because as you, as you publish data with an MDS and you could you create something called subscription to use and expose that data, you're going to have to see here that you've got some errors. If we uh, page down here a little bit, We'll be able to see uh, expand a little bit of screen up here, but we should be able to see over here right if we reach down what the errors were. The screen is in a little bit. Let's come for this particular record that state province is fired. Uh, that's actually just a test in this case Paris and uh, we don't have the set up right. Again the idea is here gonna be the playground of your business users and data analysts and actually 
be able to enter and manage that. I see that it's uh, about 37 after. I'm going to keep stepping here. Uh, so we can taken a look at Explorer. Let's do a quick watch. How do we create those things? Again, I'm going to refer to the tab we have. It's not in the system administration. We can hear that we have various models there to us. Uh, in this case, we're Today, now that we're in, uh, and in, menu in here, what we're able to do is to go back to our menu. Uh, so we'll reverse model, but let's just take a look at this section. In case all of you, which gives us this kind of drillable ability to look in the models and uh, drill. So is it is the plus sign up here says, I want to add an entity. We're not going to do that. If we take a look at our entity here, customer, which is a relatively complex one, the minute we click on it, we now get the ability to edit it, uh, manage the groups, set up any kind of business rules, or simply delete it. If we were to hit edit, which is very much like the interface for adding an entity, you can see that we come up, we have our customer, our entity name, we have a staging table name is another topic that you could spend a whole hour on in terms of understanding and setting up your staging tables. Be that as it may, uh, what's important here is if you type it in, you'll get a different name. And then you basically have what, what here are your leaf members. These are the members that are being included in your entity. Each one of these is defined. Name this website. Let's pick here like uh, Country. What I want to do is, well, I let me go back to the top side. Let's pick address line one. And uh, as we pick address line here, so once you select it, then you get another icon over here with enter and edit it. It's very straightforward. The name is address line one. What you can't see here that's grayed out is it's free form. You can set the display width. And then in here for data types, you have only a few options text and numeric. And then this uh, enable change tracking is uh, that kind of an advanced feature, obviously self-describing. More importantly, though, if we look at another type of an entity like a country, can we take a look at that? Country is a domain-based entity. And what's important about that is country is actually based on the entity country. So what's critical is that that link, that very case, and that use of those domain-based attributes really constitutes the main functionality in terms of reuse with an MDS. That the M defined entity, as I'm physically creating in here, what my model presented, I don't have an example of a model to pop up for you. In essence, that, that the model that you put together and those dimensional, we are going to be guide walking through the GUI and create these processes. So and a quick look at the entity again. From model view perspective, if you can see our customer entity consists of several each of the plus signs domain based attributes. Uh, that if you were to look at this as a model, you would again see that some dimension can model customer in the middle or party, if you will, be surrounded by reference abilities. So I look at it at least from my
and it very quickly we're going to separate why on those. This process where we've gone through and related customers and we've included some domain based networks all come together when we come back over here to the server and have our user come in and build up the entertainment. Uh, and again, we time back here while well, we explore, we we'll want to do explore real quick. So we'll start this on Scratch. If we open a blank spreadsheet, I put it in the master data, Excel it in, and all I do is we show you the interface that looks from an uh, Excel perspective. It's critical, uh, and I'm somewhat reluctant because of the capability. So I, I've done connect. We're already connected to a, a, a model. I'm going to our customer sample shows us the entities that we have over here for MBS. If I will click on customer, and uh, we will end with our ability to now look at and manage. Obviously, this is critical since many of you are going to much prefer the Excel interface and her web interface. A deal that you have signed that become a little problematic. For instance, uh, if we would have take samples of any data that I just showed you, were, uh, really kind of anything at all, where we can copy those. And uh, we're simply able over here to open a blank script and uh, paste data in, in, into the master data interface. Uh, basically come over here and well, actually let me, let me hook up. So connect to our and we connect to the customer symbol and actually you know we've got an entity as a table and in column and we'd like to connect that entity. We've selected the range, we put the model, actually uh, that's my little sandbox model. We're going to give it a name. Uh, we pick the column is actually the code value. And we pick the column, and that's the name value. And we would basically be create that entity. Uh, important, impressive that sound, yes, is application that's still giving the dirt. Facilities with Excel add in, and actually, I think that can tend to be you a feeling of comfort if I can get entities out there and start working with one you really want. Because unless you actually got the domain values and things, the Excel add is not going to work for you. And then, given that with a few minutes uh, I have left, with, there are a couple of articles I'd like you to take a look at. Uh, one is on the uh, server. Myself. So now I see it. Right. Uh, I've been SQL Server.
we certainly don't need to do it with SNS. The reason to focus on this is because you're going to a couple of data cleansing and data issues, and if I ask you to access this by us, you're cleansing, you matching, and drop and add correction components. The article also brings you through over SSIS, also link the Nick Burke's article where he shows you how to do your best case. Secondly, go here, excellent article by Jeremy. And I think for developers, folks that are in there, he's got a sample here. And he knows and blanks. Uh, but what he did that was most excellent was very quickly, well, he shows you how to go in and create the model. And it's only a small one entity model. He then puts together the SQL load code, the values, and then walks you through the process of actually loading them and then causing the model to be loaded and validated in SQL. And he does that in about 50 some lines of code, which I find is an excellent primer for folks who are just trying to understand how do I get things in and how can I do things without going through the GUI in its entirety? Uh, and, and I think that from, what I'd like to do is, is uh, throw that back to, to Jen. I really appreciate the time. Hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, there are many, many articles and resources out there in terms of MDS and many folks who have begun to contribute and, and provide some capabilities, but I find that it's still relatively sporadic. <laughs> Uh, so if there are any questions uh, at all, Jen or anything, I'd, I'd like to make sure I give everybody the opportunity. Hello there. Yes, we have some questions. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. All right, good, good. Yeah, thank you very much for that interesting session. We do have some questions, if that's okay. And the first sure. one is from Michael, who wants to know what are facts tables equivalent to in Microsoft terminology? Well, yeah, and, and I, I, I almost apologize for throwing the terminology out there, but uh, if we were to look at our model, let me relate this back to, to MDM, I'm sorry. If we were to look at our, our actual MDM app, one second, and uh, let's go back to model view. A fact table, a fact table in the BI world, and a lot of my presentation here is relating is relating uh, the creation and loading of an MDS model, which is an MDM application, to uh, to what I view as dimensional models. So a lot of our activities turn out to be similar to uh, creating dimensional models. Jeremy Cashel points that out in his book, in, in that the heart of the MDM model is very dimensional. That means that you have, in this case, if we look at our customer sample, and this isn't a great visual representation, but I think you'll get the idea. Customer is kind of in the middle. That's the fact table. So there is a customer with a customer code. And it's surrounded on the out, outside by address information, state information, customer type information, currency type information. So you, you've got this fact in the middle. Where it differs from a true dimensional fact table is that in an MDM model, a customer happens to be unique and he's surrounded by uh, other dimensions, or in this case, other entities that relate to him, as opposed to, say, a high volume of sales transactions. But conceptually, uh, it's, it's really the same. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. I mean, fact table is a term that's used in dimensional modeling in BI. It doesn't specifically relate to MDS, so I apologize. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that helps, Michael. Here we had another question from Joseph. He wants to know if a business user makes a change in the Web Explorer interface to a table that's loaded from an SSIS package, what happens to the user's changes when the table is loaded from SSIS at the next scheduled run? Well, there are uh, in uh, there are there's something I'm just I'm hesitating because I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you the table. So let's just take a look. When the table is created, the leaf table, uh, and let's take our 
our customer table here. We're going to bring it up. Okay, we'll uh, we'll just script it out. That table. Oops, sorry. That table. Here we go. Sorry. That table has got something on it called an import status type. Here, one second. Why did this go away? Okay. Uh, that table has got something called an import status type. That isn't showing up here real well. But what I can show you is, uh, I'll go back to my PowerPoint. Sorry, I was trying to be all techy there and it didn't work. This staging table here has got something called an import status type. There are six types. Zero, 01, zero, uh, actually there are seven types, zero through six. It's key to understand how to use those and you can do a lot with those. For instance, one says, I'm brand new, and if I'm already in there, if, I, if I'm, I'm loading a member that's already in there, reject me. The zero says, if I'm in there, change, or if I'm null, ignore. And then you can go on to three, four, and five where you can delete entities or manage. So your loading strategy, and in this case, in a couple of cases uh, where I've written SSAS packages or SQL scripts, I've actually included logic and in a small table to drive what I wanted to do. Uh, do I want to replace members? Do I want to delete members and then replace them? But be that as it may, it is very much in your control to determine am I going to keep what's in there or am I going to override it? So your question is excellent and it's one of the key uh, decision points in your design effort in that you're going to end up actually designing a little mini ETL data-driven application in most cases or a bunch of manual packages for you to be able to say, oh, this time I'm loading and I want to wipe everything out, or this time I'm loading and I want to do basically a change data capture. So it's really determined by that import status type indicator on the staging table. It's also important to note that if you were to look at the staging table, one of the things that you can see right off the bat is that they are going to keep their data in them until you clean them up. So you're able to go in and basically uh, we'll show you a staging table here. For instance, if we were to look at what was inside, uh, say, customer. Then you're going to be able to uh, see that it will keep the values and you're able to go back out to that staging table and basically uh, determine what was loaded or added. Uh, I would add that in the, the tool itself, that was it. That was if you were smart enough to be able to actually type a query, which apparently I'm not able to do. <laughs> but uh, I guess I, I apologize for that total deficiency on a live broadcast. But the, the point is the table itself has an import status type and it has an, a status indicator. So MBS is going to update that staging table and come back and say, yes, I loaded it or no, it was an error. And actually, as you, as you ask that question, if you look in MDS, one of the things that's uh, key is you're, you're, as you look at something called the, we didn't go in here, but if you look in the integration capabilities, you're going to be able to look at your transactions and see whether they loaded or whether they erred. And MDS uh, actually has a, <laughs> a unique and idiocentric way where if you happen to have a problem with one of your entities, so here you can see we had errors. MDS actually will generate a query for you. You have to co hit copy on that query, come back over here, come into your MDS model, paste in that query, and then you can find out what indeed those errors were. Actually, I've probably cleaned out those errors since this was started. Uh, but that's just one of the examples of where there are many, many capabilities in terms of using MDS to satisfy your MDM needs, but there are also many things you need to understand and pull together in terms of uh, tips and techniques. Kind of a long answer there. Sorry. And Jen, back to you. Oops. Hello? Sorry. Hello there. I I'm muted sure. myself. Can you hear me? I'm not sure. Any... Can you hear me? Sorry. Sorry. No, it's all right. It's my fault. Yeah. I muted myself while I was speaking, uh, while you were talking, and uh, then forgot to unmute Sorry. myself. No, one don't apologize. It's my fault. I got, I got nervous because of the sirens again, so go ahead. Oh, that's all right. Uh, as long as it's not your building, then we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So um, it's quite a big interesting question from Michael again actually. Um, it's more thought leadership about MDS generally and um, I think what Michael's interested in is the background behind the ideas of MDS. So the whole idea of enforcing the version of the truth via rules. Um, so obviously you need to, for me personally, I think it's a key thing to involve business users because um, otherwise trying to force changes on them and isolation doesn't work very well. It's their data, they know it best. But um, Michael's really interested in the background, um, how it relates to yeah, consistency I, and availability. I, I completely agree with you, uh, Jen. As a matter of fact, it, it, it deserves a whole other hour or a whole other week of sessions because MDM and MDS in, in their nature are actually relatively technically oriented. It's pretty much trying to uh, sell somebody a sausage grinder instead of trying to sell them sausage. People are interested in the outcome. And the outcome is better data. The outcome is, in my business, can I be able to uh, understand my sales reports? In this particular case, I have a client that's managing an organizational hierarchy for a large type of uh, retail application. Uh, obviously, and they're worldwide, so obviously they want to be able to have uh, a process where, in essence, the dimension that's in their data warehouse is managed and has accurate values and it has accurate mappings and can be used to calculate not only sales but sales commissions. Uh, that's the business need. So the trick there is trying to explain to management, uh, well, okay, that's great. Why do I need this whole other thing? Because it's geopolitical. When you try to implement it, you end up touching other applications and you end up messing with other organizations. Uh, so it's very critical that you you understand you approach it from a conceptual perspective first, which is why in my particular slides I pointed out that I think you have to have an understanding at the senior management level in terms of what are my requirements and then map those requirements to and communicate them on what piece of a business functionality is required and why do I need MDS to do it. It's relatively straightforward to explain. If I didn't have MDS, you can pretty much have anybody understand. If you if you explain it, my wife is in banking and, and also does quite a bit of work with us in the technology field right now. And it runs our company, Actuality Business Intelligence. And 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you were doing cross-referencing, right? And it was key that you had an understanding for mortgage transactions or probate transactions, what data was good or bad. Today, we have many, many times higher volumes of data. So in order to do proper cross-referencing, which to me is what it gets down to, you're going to need some tools and ability to do that. And you're either going to code it by hand, which means having your folks and your developers build a bunch of cross-reference tables and keep them in sync, or select a tool. And I mean, the way it's worked out and with Microsoft and their business model, MDM is huge. MDM is in the in the news. Folks are looking at it, and I'm seeing more and more folks trying to adopt MDS as their MDM solution, not understanding that just because the tool may be less expensive, it doesn't mean that they're not going to have to spend a good amount of time and effort on methodology and uh, possibly some consulting resources. And that might have been a bit of a long answer too, Jim. No, it's a good answer, and I think it's a sort of topic that could be the subject of a later podcast or something like that, because there's so much in there, and I think yeah. it'd be quite interesting to talk about um, sort of customer success stories as well, because I, I don't know about you, but I, I've got so many stories of bad data that you, you go into an organization and you think, this is a real mess. And, and then yeah. you start to look at it and you think, well, I now understand why the business people did it in that way, because they had a particular requirement. It seems strange when you look at the data, but actually when they explain to you why they did something, um, it became, it used, it's all about communication in some ways, I think. Uh, cause there's well, another, it, really, it really is. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I, you made such an excellent point, I, I apologize I'm interrupting, but that's exactly why I'm saying you need to connect those business requirements and business processes because what you're describing is their business process involves whatever they need to do to get it figured out and pay sales commission or whatever. 
and then translating that into all of the modeling and idiosyncrasy requirements for not only MDM but MDS is a pretty major task. And and you know one of the things that I, I had a great VP at Ameritech who said, look, there's a fine line between a misdeliverable and a mismanaged expectation, and plopping in MDS in the organization can really mess up the expectations very very quickly. Back to your point of these guys are doing whatever they need to do. So they've got all kinds of hidden mapping and hidden categorizations and hidden rules that you have to expose and try to load into this tool. Yeah, I think as well there's a problem sometimes. People don't want to see the dirty data. I don't know if you find that. So I think these MDS projects are actually really hard because you've got, you find yourself in a situation where there's a can of worms People have been doing things a certain way for a certain time and perhaps hiding mistakes. Um, I don't know if you come across that sometimes. I know it's sometimes something I see and it's all about the people again because you're trying to... It takes a brave organisation to look at MDS, I think. And I wonder, um, I think hopefully it will become more prevalent in the future. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I agree 100% because MDS is just the function of, of managing your cross-reference tables. It's the function of managing your company's data. And when you put it in, you're usually putting it in and it lands in between business applications or in many, many cases, BI or reporting applications. Well, the real issue with those reporting applications is today, they run them, they correct stuff, they do it in hard-coded ETL, they have a question. They answer the question, three people have to go run three reports and it takes three days to get the answers. What those applications need is the same key component to me in MDS. We didn't talk about this today, but that's lineage. Lineage means I'm going to do some mapping and data profiling, and I'm going to be able to tell you when you click on that sales quota what it is, and if there were different mappings or changing or we took something from some other organ guy's organization, I'm going to tell you how that happened. And while I believe that when you if you look at the advent of dashboards today and big data and reporting and analytics, that's actually where we need to get to. We need to be able to have kind of full disclosure of the data and the metadata because that's the cost savings for MDM and MDS. If I can say instead of it taking three or four days to answer a question, I can click and answer a question now, that's the value of uncovering that data. And it is a very political uh, hot potato because you have folks who now are getting all of their uh, all of their little issues and rules exposed up from these departmental stores. Sorry, ramble on again. I, I think you're right. I think as well. I saw a customer a few weeks ago, and they said they wanted to delete some of their data. They'd done some data cleansing, and I thought, well, that's great. And um, you're doing some cleaning, and they said, but we can't delete the data. And I said, well, why? And they said, because the column is actually appears three times in the database, and it's hanging off three different tables. And sometimes wow. we update one column, and then we update one in another table, and there's so many business processes on it. We don't know what column's the right one, because they all seem to get updated. And what they asked me really was, how can we use technology to stop us adding in duplicate columns. And I said, the truth is, technology, you can use it really well, or you can take great technology and use it badly. And you can account for every single thing which somebody might do. They've created duplicate columns for a reason. Maybe it was easier, or someone was under pressure and they just did it. But now they've got this situation. They can't clean because they need to trace back all the processes. I suppose the point I'm trying to make is um, it can really be a can of worms, but I think that makes it interesting because when you go and fix it, everyone breathes a sigh of relief. I don't know if you sort of find that. Oh, definitely. And, uh, and actually, that, that fixing is part of why I recommend a lot of you know, wherever anybody can get an understanding of data profiling. And, and for me, it's not about a tool. I've got lots of articles on how to do data profiling. and analysis. It's that. It's your ability to do some forensics. Your ability where people have gone, and, and we both run into this all over the place, where there are processes in place that were written God knows how many years ago. Uh, and I, the, the issue is, 
can I use some tools and techniques to understand what's the lineage of that data? Where did it come from? What is the impact? Uh, because that information is usually not going to be available. It's not in some source code, and it's usually just a data problem. Uh, nonetheless, you are going to ultimately have to be able to kind of unravel that to be able to move forward. And uh, most folks are very happy, but what they can overcome is that fear of, I don't want to touch it because if it's not broke, don't fix it. And in most cases, that results in very tactical short-term fixes and, and more questions and more anomalies in business reports. Yes, it's like a dripping tap. <laughs> you know, it, it only yeah. gets worse. <laughs> Never goes away by itself. Um, we've Absolutely. got. Oh, sorry, we've got um, a few more questions, one from Shishir. Hello, Shishir. Um, Shishir wants to know, can we use com composite keys for entities? So I'll just repeat that. Can we use composite keys for entities? No, you can't. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I've been at M working at MDS for a while, so I want to be careful. I, I don't really consider myself an expert. But it gets back to that modeling question. In MDS, you design everything based on name and code. You have one key for an entity in MDS, one and only one. Uh, what you have to understand is that you get to that composite key conceptually, and if you have a, you know, if you, if you, that's why I suggest you kind of build out a logical model so that you understand the relationships that you need for any kind of associative tables that you have because those are going to be supported by creating domain-based attributes. Because a domain-based attribute in MDS has to have a field in it that allows you to relate to the attribute that you're trying to put it in. So if I'm going to, if I have a customer, if I have a customer ID, or let's just take country for instance, country, city, and zip code, a zip code has in it a domain-based attribute of city. Well, city is going to have to be in zip code for me to be able to relate it back to, uh, I mean, in postal code for me to relate it back to zip code. So the whole idea is beginning to understand exactly the, the exactly how the gears and cogs within MDS work, which is all name code, name code, name code, and domain-based attributes. There are some other things you can do where they talk about hierarchies, but for now, for the most part, I think in the beginning you can ignore those. You just have to understand that all relationships are going to be based on entities' code value and an entity's domain-based uh, domain-based attributes. Sorry. Yeah, I was thinking. Um, I think that's right. I think um, the, from, from what I remember of Kimball methodology, you don't want to introduce any dependencies anywhere where you don't need them. Um, it's to keep things but, uh, it's isolated from each other as possible. So I have not been a fan of composite keys myself. I've seen cases right. where they cause problems because you start to introduce dependencies. Um, and that happens when people try to load data because you know it can't find something to generate its key, so it then fails. So um, that's, I suppose, a very just a practical reason, but that's just my, my experience. Um, I'm no MDS expert, but I tend to be a data detective, <laughs> you know, and you end up with <laughs> these sort of problems, I think. And we've just got one last thing, which is about use cases. Um, do you generate use cases as part of the process? And if you do, um, how might that sort of look? Have you got an example? Well, I don't have an example. However, I, 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 I would really recommend using use cases. I, in, in the projects I've been, have usually been uh, coming in, in in the middle of things. So I basically have to go back and rebuild and recreate use cases, I think they're critical. And as I mentioned, in, in creating what I called a, a set of metric and dimension worksheets, one of those worksheets would obviously be the use cases that were based on, uh, that we would be basing the uh, design on. I mean, if you think about it, you obviously want to have an understanding from your clients uh, what are their use cases. A lot of times I look at it, it would be nice if I understand or have any documentation on the business processes then it's relatively straightforward to do some interviews and gather some use cases uh, where we can be able to say, okay, here's the processes we're going to or the steps we're going to for this particular process, and here's what's expected. So I think it's critical that you get those gathered and documented as much up front and then be able to, to match up against those as you go through your design and iterate through. 
Yeah, that sounds good, I think. It's um, the whole issue of documentation is a, is a can of worms as well. People don't tend to have any, or if they do, it's out of date. <laughs> or it's it's always the thing that's tacked on at the end. But I'm conscious of time, actually. Um, I didn't mean to keep you so long, but our conversation's been flowing really well. well I'm sort of hesitating to stop. <laughs> um, but, oh, I, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I that's hope, all right. I hope it it was really useful. I really enjoyed your session, and it's really sparked a lot of questions. I, I I deal a lot with the virtual chapters. I'm taking over that as my portfolio, and I don't think I've ever seen so many comments and queries. But I love that because I think it shows people were really engaged. So I hope you'll come back and do another session for us another time. Absolutely. Let's uh, let's do another one, like we said, particularly on kind of the. Uh, the thought leadership part, because I think if people can get a better awareness of what they're getting into, they can we can get some better results. Yes, forearmed is forewarned, <laughs> definitely. Yes. Yes. All right. So thank you very much for your session. I thought that was really good, um, and I just want to say a big thank you from me and thank you from everyone else. Um, what we'll do is I'll upload this session to the PASS website, I'll do that tonight and it should be on our website tomorrow and we will have more sessions in the new year at the SQL PASS Business Intelligence chapter so keep your eyes open for our next email which will go out at the beginning of January and in the meantime um, Ira has given us our last presentation of the year. So with that, I want to wish you all the best of the season's greetings and a happy Hogmanay or a happy new year when it comes. Thank you everybody and wherever you are in the world. Good morning, good evening and good night. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.